my daughter Annabelle has reached what is sometimes called the terrible age of two. If you are or have been a parent, you know how difficult and wonderful this time is. Annabelle discovered the speech and went. You rush after a staggering little man who seems to be able to move across the earth at the speed of light. A person who has an amazing vocabulary, but only uses the word no to the exclusion of all others. It was Saturday evening and I was giving my daughter a bath with the help of Mr. Bubbles. It was a long day. In our house, weekends are mostly dad time. Being a father, I got up early, along with Annabelle. Swing! she said at the beginning of the day. It was a day that included a park with swings, a small carousel, and a variety of slides. By the time I took my bath, I was practically exhausted. Kate, my wife of five years, was cleaning the house that day. It seemed like a fair deal. Kate is an attorney in a large firm. She practices criminal law. She makes six figures and we use house cleaning services. But she is a finicky person who needs everything to be just right and in its place. Two-year-olds are slobs. The division of labor in our home has definitely changed to reflect this fact. Kate was a mother with her baby constantly resting on her hip, but when the baby started running away, the dad took over in pursuit. Kate had her bachelorette party this evening. Lately, there have been more than just a few. I explained this by the need to communicate with friends after she was tied up as a baby. I'm going out to meet the taxi, Kate said, leaning over to kiss my cheek while I bathed Annabelle. Then Kate leaned in to kiss our daughter. At the same time, she pressed herself close to me. I caught the scent of her perfume. It was such a small thing. She had a whole dozen perfumes. I never noticed them, but they were different. She had never used this scent before. I knew this because I recognized them immediately. When I was five years old, my mother died. On a cold winter night, a car accident took her life. When she kissed me goodbye that night, she was wearing Chanel No. 5. It was a memory of a smell, a powerful and unmistakable confession. I didn't know Kate had this perfume, and I knew for sure that she had never worn it before. I froze, and at the same moment looked at her carefully. She was wearing what women call a short coat. This is a light coat, more like a loose-fitting raincoat with a belt. It reached to the knees, but opened above the waist revealing a black dress. The coat hid what she was wearing, but not completely. I thought I recognized the dress and, of course, the 10-centimeter stiletto pumps she wore. Where are you going this evening? I asked very casually. At Mario, she said. I knew Ben Walker was playing Mario. Ben was something of a local celebrity. He had ambitions as a concert pianist, but played at any musical event he could. I knew Ben. By the end of the evening, he will be playing sad love songs. The women who flocked to Mario loved Ben and his game. My good friend and I never missed a single night when Ben played Mario. Mario's was a mid-priced restaurant and bar with a small dance floor. Ben could play dreamy dance ballads, but he always ended with the slow love songs that women love to dance to. I myself love to dance them while holding my lady in my arms. Mario's was the kind of place you'd expect a group of women to spend an evening out. I trusted Kate. The explanation was reasonable. She was a beautiful woman, more feminine than an average-looking man like me would be attracted to. But she was not a movie star, and we were happy together for five years. Opposites may be different, but we suit each other. I'll be home around 11, she said. I was busy with Annabelle, and all bad thoughts were pushed into the background. Half an hour later, Annabelle and I were sitting in front of the TV in the family room watching Cinderella, I don't know how much of this she understood, but her entire attention was focused on the performance. We watched it over and over again until she fell asleep. I turned off the TV and just sat with the sleeping princess in my arms. I know I'm lucky. I'm happier than I deserve. Guys like me don't have a nice house, a beautiful wife, and a daughter like Annabelle. I was 17 when I joined the army to become everything I should be. However, I was not what the Army wanted. I did well on their tests. I had a high school diploma and reasonable, if not impressive, grades. Something just wasn't right. I had no problems with discipline. Physically, I was much stronger than average. But there was no place for me in the Army. After the basic one, they found me one meaningless position after another. 
I guess I expected to be a soldier and carry a gun. Instead, the army decided that I would become a clerk. But I was hopeless in the office. I turned out to be absolutely useless for anything. They tried me in the canteen, but I didn't know how to cook. I lasted a day and a half. They sat me down and explained that I had no abilities and that I was good for nothing. So it became obvious that I would make an excellent military policeman. They turned out to be right. I succeeded in this work. In fact, this was an impossible task if one followed the instructions strictly. The Army correctly determined that I was one of those unique individuals who could handle this position. This required a complete lack of remorse and very high moral standards. One had to focus on achieving the right result without worrying about how to achieve it. I received my first promotion in Iraq for killing a woman with children. A car driven by a woman tried to crash into the checkpoint, and I saw that there were children in the car. The fact that a woman was driving was just the final clue. I knew something was wrong the moment I first saw her. I watched her get in line and waited. When she made her first move, I made mine. Sixty armor-piercing shells do a lot, but nowhere near what her four and a half kilograms of TNT could do. My career took off, but I don't believe that the command approved of me. At least the commander doesn't. He reported this by calling me one day to tell me about the problem. Listen, you fatherless son of a bitch. I know all about the shit that goes on behind you. But I have a problem here, so fix it, he said. He actually had a problem. A young soldier was raped. Three of the rapists were officers, all West Point graduates. A good general had a real big scandal. In such situations, people can lose control. It wasn't really the commander's fault, but it didn't seem to matter. A good commander knows that he must use the resources at his disposal. Later, three crippled West Point assholes, along with a very happy servicewoman, and I had reached the pinnacle of my army career. I called and reported everything to the general. What do we call it? He asked. We are still discussing whether it was friendly fire or an accidental shot. You do not know. Well, my clerk is leaning toward an accidental shot Dewey to combat stress. Is the woman happy? He asked it. Exceptional, I said. And what do I owe you? The general asked it. Well, I need an honorable discharge for my boyfriend. Do you want to fuck me? You want to give an honorable discharge to the idiot who shot three officers? Fight stress. I have a medical certificate in front of me, signed by a doctor, I said. I didn't mention that I had personally overturned the doctor's DUI charge the week before, and the fact that my boyfriend used heroin, not marijuana. Okay, send it, but are you sure about the girl? He asked. The girl can finish her service. They are helping her. The army, as they say, is strong. This seemed to anger the general. You may be useful, but you're still a son of a bitch, he said. I never stated otherwise, but don't hesitate to call again. My door is always open, I said when he hung up. I spent ten years in security before retiring. Then he received veterans' benefits and studied public safety for two years, earning a certificate. I went to work as the head of the security service at the railway. One evening we caught some guys trying to steal plasma TVs from container ships at the train station. I was called to testify in court. That's how I met Kate. She was then an assistant district attorney. Two years later we got married. A few years later they became parents. I put Annabelle to bed and went to our bedroom. We had a modest three-bedroom house that we bought as soon as we got married. Money was an issue for us in those early years. Kate had a ton of student loans to pay off. I started looking for perfume and there it was, front and center of her dresser cabinet. There were a dozen perfume bottles, but this one was new. The closet in the master bedroom is large, but even so it barely fits Kate's entire wardrobe. It was well organized and I started looking through it. I knew what kind of black dress I was looking for. She never threw away anything that could still be worn. She hasn't worn a black dress like this since we started dating. It was very chic, expensive, and short. It was her damn me black dress that she was wearing tonight along with the high heels. There was no dress in her wardrobe. She wasn't wearing earrings when she was in the bath before, but she always wore diamond studs with a dress like that. I checked her jewelry box. The studs have disappeared. 
My wife allegedly went out with the girls but dressed as if to seduce. It took me less than 20 minutes to find her. I didn't even leave the house. I only carry my main cell phone provided by my employer, but she had an iPhone. In case she lost her iPhone, I didn't want to resort to a plan to replace it. So I installed a Find My iPhone program on her phone instead. I opened my laptop and quickly found her phone number. It was not at Mario's. It was a completely different restaurant. Vincenti, extremely high class, too rich for our budget. Maybe my wife could afford it, but not me. A little searching in Street View and I had Vincenti's front door on my computer. It wasn't even eight yet, but I'm a patient person. Just after nine, my wife came out. I recognized this man immediately. Judge Leonard Simple, recent appointment to the federal bench. I met him several years ago at a county Republican Party meeting at a Fourth of July picnic when he was still district attorney. A good dozen years older than me and 15 older than Kate. But here she is in all her glory, kissing him as they leave the restaurant. I didn't like Simple from the very first meeting. He was nothing more than a vile politician. He may have been someone whom women considered good-looking, even handsome, but he had sly eyes and a commanding manner. Moreover, there was an aura around him that told the other man, arrogant and weak. I didn't like the way he looked at my wife and I told her so. Kate lofted off. By eleven, Katie had not reached home. It was half past one when from the window of the third bedroom I watched her get out of his Mercedes. We live in an old 1970s development with smaller houses around a cul-de-sac. They parked so she could return through the back entrance. I expected this. My wife is a careful and meticulous woman. She expected me to be asleep, but she was also prepared for a different turn of events. What she didn't expect was for her clueless husband to find out about her. When she entered our bedroom, I was lying in bed, feigning sleep. She went straight to her jewelry box. Diamond studs were her first concern, and then she came into her wardrobe. Expanding the closet was the only change we made to the house. She must have changed clothes in the closet because she appeared in an old terry robe. Then she left the bedroom and walked down the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the shower running. Leaving the bedroom, I walked to the bathroom door and turned the knob but my always cautious wife locked the door. I couldn't catch her erasing evidence this evening, so I went back to bed. When she finally came in, she carefully lifted the covers and climbed into bed, snuggled close to me, and I heard her say quietly, I love you. There will be a reckoning, but not today. FBI Special Agent Thomas Makepeace was a seasoned veteran. Divorced from his wife after 18 years of marriage and with two children, he was approaching retirement. His seniority earned him a quiet position, but saddled him with a junior agent, Sheila Marks, as a partner. Together they crossed the police fence, showing off their crusts. Sheila smiled, enjoying the respect that came from the FBI's reputation. Stop smiling, agent. At the end of the day, the man is dead, Makepeace said. Sheila put on a business-like expression. She was a tall woman with an athletic build, she was not very pleasant to look at, but she was smart and had military experience. She quickly passed through Quantico Naval Station, gaining recognition, but not as a field agent. Make Peace believed that with her size and military bearing, she would be better suited for use in a special forces unit. Her very short haircut suited her. Determining who was in charge, the agents headed towards a tall woman in her forties. Connie Baker was a CID lieutenant. Her team was spread out throughout the area, but she oversaw the recovery of the body by forensic inquest personnel. I was waiting for you, she said, seeing the agents approaching. How are you, Connie? asked Tom. Okay, what about you? I've been better. This is my new partner, Sheila Marks, Tom said. And then, waving his hand, introduced Lieutenant Connie Baker. Nice to meet you, Sheila said. And to me, Connie said to Sheila before turning to make peace. I'm sorry, I heard about your marriage. She wasn't really sorry, but it was exactly what was expected of her. Personally, Connie thought that the former Mrs. Makepeace was a complete idiot. Leaving a man like Tom was the last thing Connie would do. So, what do we have here? Tom asked. One dead federal judge, Connie said. Looks like a robbery. 
But, two hours later, but there was still some left. The murder of a sitting judge was not a common occurrence. So Tom, along with Connie, carefully examined the scene. Connie was a good and reliable investigator. The FBI had no reason to interfere with her investigation, so Tom took his actions in a different direction. Judge Simple was a district attorney and, as a lawyer, had a reputation for being tough on crime. Perhaps someone was seeking payback, or the crime could be connected to an unsolved case. Tom agreed to share Connie's efforts. He and Sheila will explore all possibilities that don't involve robbery. FBI labs will process the evidence, and Connie and local authorities will check everything related to the robbery. The next ten days did not bring much progress. Criminologists have a good handle on the details of the crime. Leonard Simple was shot from a distance of about five feet. He was literally hit with a bullet right between the eyes. There was only one shot, and it was fired from a Walter PC-0038. This pistol was quiet, easy to conceal, and very powerful. The weapon of a professional. But a professional would shoot from behind or from the side. The judge was killed on his way out of the front door at about eight in the evening, and the lighting on the porch revealed the killer's face to him. Whoever shot Simple wanted his victim to see him. He wanted this man to know who was killing him, Tom thought. So it had to be some kind of revenge. But who and why? None of the obvious suspects matched the crime. There were hardened criminals, but their motives and availability were not suitable. His phone rang. The call was from Connie. We found some stolen items from a dealer, she said. They had a suspect in custody, a methamphetamine dealer named Alex Sloams. I won't say anything without my lawyer, Sloams began. That's right, Connie replied. But this is FBI Special Agent Makepeace, and he has a one-time get-out-of-jail card for you. Sloams tensed at the mention of the FBI, then relaxed as Connie's words sunk in. There's no harm in listening, said Sloams. Tom Makepeace explained what they were looking for and what they were willing to give for it. So, do you have anything to tell me? Makepeace asked in conclusion. Yes, I don't know the name, but I can describe the guy who handed me the goods. A few hours later, the district attorney and the legal aid attorney signed a deal, and Alex Sloams began working with the crime artist. The picture, with good detail, turned out to be completely useless, and Connie and Tom knew it as soon as they saw it. Another hour of questioning Sloam, and they were convinced of this. It's someone else, said Tom. You're right, Connie replied, looking at the photo of an obvious drug addict who had been on his way for a long time. This was what was expected, and therefore clearly a false lead. None of this makes sense. What is the street value of a Walther P-38, about $1,000? asked Tom. More. The gun is clearly worth more than all the items taken from the victim. No drug addict would go to the suburbs to commit this crime if he already had the means to fix it, Connie said. No, it was done by someone who had a motive, who wanted to confuse us and knew how to do it, Tom suggested. In the end, they agreed to show the picture, but take a closer look at the victim and who might want him dead. I think it was something personal, Tom Makepeace said. Kate was worried. It wasn't just that the FBI asked to meet with her. Kate more or less expected this sooner or later. If the authorities do not immediately find the culprit, they will try to interrogate her because she was Len Simple's mistress. The romance lasted for a long time, and after the birth of their daughter it became even more intense. Kate loved her husband Bill. He was a wonderful man and a wonderful father, but not all that exciting. He was a good, balanced, reliable guy. Len was handsome, rich, and powerful. But Len wasn't the marrying kind, and he definitely wasn't the kind of man you wanted to spend your life with or have children with. Len was also vain and self-centered. Kate could be with him for a few days at a time, but not all the time, and certainly not as a spouse. This suited Lena, all he wanted from a woman was sex and a few hours of company once or twice a week. Len was not Don Juan. He liked women, but he preferred a steady partner with whom he was comfortable. She and Kate were close friends with benefits. They felt a little passion for each other, but not enough to get married. Len's death 
hit Kate hard. Her grief was difficult to hide from her husband. The funeral was tense. Everyone continued to express their condolences to her. Len's only remaining family member is his older sister, Charlotte. She was officially the chief mourner, but she and everyone who worked with Len and Kate knew about the relationship between the famous defense lawyer and the judge. Kate thought about leaving her husband at home, but could not think of a good reason why he should not attend the funeral with her. Most people thought that Bill was at least okay with her relationship with Len. Only her closest friends knew the truth. She completely hid her long-standing romantic relationship with the powerful district attorney and then with the judge from her caring and loving husband, but saw her deception as more of a protection for Bill. She protected him from the harsh fact that he could never compete with a powerful man like Leonard Simple, a man who took everything he wanted for himself. If it was up to Len, poor Bill would be faced with a love triangle situation, but the only condition Kate insisted on was that Bill didn't have to know anything. The funeral escalated this deception as people continued to express sympathy for her. Even someone as trusting as Bill may be alerted to the existence of something more than just a professional relationship. There was no sex between the couple for a week after the funeral, although Bill otherwise remained as warm and loving as ever. Just three days earlier, her husband had pulled her into bed and grabbed her with an incomprehensible fury. Since then, sex has been almost unchanged. This behavior was quite strange for her husband. Kate hoped that even if Bill had his suspicions, he would decide to leave everything with Len outside of them as a couple. Will what he doesn't know matter? The interview with the FBI was disturbing, and she felt that she needed to somehow limit their actions. It was important to keep the investigation away from Bill. She needs to maintain Bill's ignorance, or at least his ability to live in reluctance to acknowledge the facts. She needed to give him the peace of mind that he deserved and deserved as her kind and faithful husband. Special Agent Make Peace was impressed. The law offices of Stanford Price, Clark, and Morgan were large, luxurious, and decidedly expensive. The request to speak to Mrs. Ford caused misunderstanding. What about Catherine Morgan? said Sheila, Agent Marks. Oh, Mrs. Morgan, I'll tell her you're here, the administrator said. Tom Makepeace could tell that his inexperienced partner had done her homework and was already jumping to conclusions. The information they uncovered pointed to a long-standing sexual relationship between the high-profile lawyer and the victim, but they were only here to conduct a preliminary interview. Hide your moral indignation and keep it away from your face, Tom whispered to Sheila. Sorry, but Mrs. Morgan? Not Ford? Does her husband have no idea that she's not using his last name? She whispered back. Kate Morgan came out to greet them. She was a tall woman with shoulder-length black hair, dressed in a luxurious dark gray pinstripe business suit that showed off her slim but sexy figure. It was appropriate to describe this woman as beautiful. She led them into the office, large, bright, and elegantly furnished. As they sat down in the plush chairs around the coffee table, Kate suggested they freshen up and began talking as they gave up both coffee and tea. I assume you're here about Len's murder, she asked. Yes, we heard that you were a close friend of Judge Simple, Tom answered. Kate's serene smile lit up her face as she said, Let's be honest, I was his mistress, and it was for quite a long time, just over eight years. Tom was surprised by the woman's shameless frankness and apparent lack of embarrassment, but it certainly made things easier. Well, thanks for your frankness, Tom said. I really want to help in any way I can and honesty seems to be the least I can do to help. I hope you understand that I would appreciate your privacy, she said. Of course, but wasn't your relationship publicly known? Oh, I don't believe it. Thanks to long-standing relationships, many colleagues and friends have felt or suspected something, but real knowledge? I don't believe anyone can say for sure. Even your husband? Sheila asked sarcasm barely visible on the surface of her words. Kate's smile only grew wider, and she allowed herself to show some leniency towards the big, unattractive agency show. My husband is a wonderful family man, but not very sophisticated. He wouldn't understand my relationship with Len. I'm sure he didn't know until recently that Len was anything other than a former colleague to me. 
Kate said, then turned to make peace and continued. I ask that he be left out of this matter. He doesn't know anything useful, and I want to preserve his peace of mind. What happened recently that could have bothered him? asked Tom. Well, I suspect, at the funeral, many people expressed their condolences to me, realizing how close Len and I were. My husband is trusting, but not stupid. That's a strange way to describe a man who rose to serve in the military police and is now the head of security at a railway station, protecting tens of millions of pieces of equipment and goods, Sheila commented, chomping at the bit. As Tom feared, the inexperienced Sheila came to conclusions without evidence. He reached out and lightly grabbed her forearm, holding her still. Forgive my colleague, said Tom, but in the circumstances, her question is appropriate. Kate seemed to think, well, my husband is a very capable man, and yes, this is a demanding job, but you misjudge his character. He is a family man, a devoted father, and a loving husband. I admit that I deeply regret taking advantage of his trust in me. But you must understand, my relationship with Len Simple began long before my marriage. He was a powerful man. It was difficult for him to resist, and he was not inclined to give up what he considered to be his by right. However, our relationship was no deeper than sincere friendship. He started out as my mentor. I owe much of my current success to his help and guidance, Kate said. But you didn't tell your husband and you believe that he didn't know? Asked Tom. Yes, I hid my relationship with Len from my husband. Bill is the man I love. He is my partner in an exclusive marriage. His knowledge of Lena and this relationship would not benefit anyone. It would hurt Bill needlessly. Since my relationship with Len was ongoing and should have lasted as long as Len wanted, telling Bill about Len and me would not have done any good. It's clear. Could you tell us where you were? The night Len died, and probably at the very moment he died, I was at Valentine's restaurant, waiting for Len. I'm sure the staff will be able to confirm this to you. We were regulars there, she said, her eyes watering at the memory. I'm sorry, I... It's okay, we understand. These circumstances are never easy. But do you know where your husband was at that time? Asked Tom. Kate began wiping her eyes with a handkerchief. Yes. He was at work. His shift is from four to midnight, but he rarely leaves before two in the morning. The train station is packed at night, but please be careful when checking. It would be unfair to involve my husband in this. I understand and thank you again for your frankness, Tom said. As the agents began to rise, Kate suddenly remembered something. Do you happen to know what happened to Len's watch? Kate asked. Tom turned. For hours? Yes. It was a special gift that I gave him two weeks before his death. It was an anniversary of sorts. We were together for eight years. They were rose gold and very expensive. They were not among the things his sister found after the funeral. I'm guessing they were on it that evening. No, we have no idea. The police only recovered his ring and gold cross. But I don't think they knew about the watch, Tom said. Sister Lena said that he didn't have them in his personal belongings, but as far as I know... He started wearing them, she said. Can you describe them? Well, it's a rose gold Rolex watch with the inscription, Love, Catherine, and Annabelle, your ladies. I'll let the homicide detectives know they might have been stolen, Tom said. Tom agreed to meet Connie at Valentine's. He put on his best suit, suspecting that the meeting, scheduled for eight in the evening, was about more than just business. I'm glad you could come, Connie said. She was sitting at a separate table. This was definitely a couple's restaurant. It was clear why Judge Simple had chosen him for his love affairs with Kate Morgan, a.k.a. Mrs. William Ford. Connie was dressed for a prestigious restaurant and more. She wore a black dress with a deep V-neck line that showed off her ample cleavage. In addition, the dress was shorter than a woman of about 40 would usually wear, but this did not bother her. She got her hair and nails done. She was a beautiful woman too damn beautiful. Tom reminded himself that she was at least a dozen years younger than him and was his colleague. Stop thinking too much and sit down, Connie said. Tom smiled. Now you read minds. Men are so obvious about some things, but in general they are so stupid, she said. 
Sorry, it's just... It's just okay. We're adults, single, and this is the best restaurant in town, she said. Okay, he said, when the waitress approached. This is Tara, Connie said. Tell Agent Make Peace what you told me. Waitress Tara was clearly a little nervous. Well, they were just an odd couple. You wouldn't notice it at first. He was a large, handsome man and looked well off. I wasn't surprised when I heard people calling him a judge. She was cool, very attractive, and much younger. The kind of woman you'd expect from such a man. Except they didn't look like a couple with any kind of affection for each other. You'd think she was a paid escort, but she clearly wasn't that type. And in fact, she was some sort of professional, probably a lawyer, Tara said, finishing her assessment of Judge Simple and Mrs. Morgan. When you said that they had no attachment, what did you mean? asked Tom. That's it. They never came together. She waited for him, and never vice versa. She never touched him first, and when he touched her, it was possessive. When they left, he always hugged her as if he owned her. She seemed nervous. She was wearing an engagement and wedding ring with a small diamond. He also wore a ring, but it was not a wedding ring. She was clearly married, but not to him. Tom had an idea. Did you notice if he wore a watch? Tara smiled and spoke animatedly. Yes, after she gave them to him, right at that table, she handed him a box. It was the only time I saw them kiss for real. He was very pleased with her gift and the inscription on it. An inscription? Connie asked. Yes, I remember because it was a little strange. Something like, From Catherine and Annabelle, your loving ladies. I remember wondering who Annabelle was. I knew he called her Kate, and sometimes Kitten. When did she give him the watch? Asked Tom. Tara thought, It must have been more than three weeks ago. I remember it was Friday. She was dressed to the nines, but much sluttier than usual. This dress looked tight and was so short and low-cut that even a street prostitute would not dare wear it. She came and waited for him, wrapped in a coat, but after his arrival, she took off her coat. The watch box appeared after dessert, and they opened a bottle of the best champagne. Two weeks later, she waited again, but he didn't show up. It wasn't the first time she'd waited for him, but it was the only time she'd waited all evening, and he never showed up. And the next day I saw on the news that he had been killed, and I felt a little guilty for telling the waiter that the bastard ditched her. Thank you, Connie said. Tara looked at them. Of course, any time. Would you like to order something? Yes, we're staying for dinner, Tom said, giving Connie a look that said, You won't refuse me, will you? The meeting with the FBI upset Kate more than she let on. This female agent looked at her like she was some kind of insect. Kate couldn't help but feel guilty and ashamed, but she still considered herself a good person, trapped by unfortunate circumstances. She was a young attorney, barely out of law school, when she caught the attention of the powerful and charismatic district attorney, Leonard Simple. Women don't refuse men like Len. Kate found herself in an even worse situation. Len was a big boss. He was a very respected lawyer, and she was at the bottom of the ladder. She was flattered by his attention and physically attracted to his masculine personality. She wasn't a virgin, but she wasn't a slut either. But although she tried not to end up in his bed, when Len Simple chose her, she had no choice but to comply. At least that's how she saw it. Kate didn't expect the relationship to last so long, but for three years they had a stable sex life. It was never actually public, but most people in the office knew about it. She was given tasks of her choice and was treated well, but her relationship with her boss kept her trapped. Bill Ford met two years after her affair with Simple began. He fulfilled her need for a permanent boyfriend. He was part cover and part comrade. Sleeping with the boss two or three times a week still left many lonely nights. Hiding the affair in plain sight meant that she sometimes needed formal dates. She and Len had different romantic interests. Their affair was secret, and they did not consider it a permanent relationship. Len did not classify them as permanent. And Kate had no desire to be his wife. Being his mistress suited her. She needed more from her husband than a man like Len could give. We have a problem she said as they lay in bed. What are you talking about? Len asked. I'm pregnant, she said. Len remained silent. 
His eyes said that fixing everything was her problem, not his. I'm going to marry Bill. We haven't slept together yet, but we will. He will not know that the child is not his. Is this how you want to solve it? He asked. Yes, I will not kill our child. I am a Catholic, a sinner, yes, but a murderer, no. Len shrugged and took her sexually. They didn't talk about it anymore. Bill was an easy task. She seduced him and arranged for them to sleep without protection. After that, she simply showed him the pregnancy test. He was more than happy and quickly married her. He had no family, but her parents were disappointed that there was no elegant wedding. Kate had been married for three months when the worst day of her life happened. She was at work when she felt dampness between her legs. An hour later at the hospital, the doctor said something spontaneous. Kate only realized that her baby was dead. Bill did just fine. He hugged her and told her how much he loved her. Planned the funeral of a child who will never exist. He was convincing and insisted that they would have many more children. Somehow, his belief in this kept her going. It was the worst time of her life, and at that moment she fell in love with her wonderful husband. Kate's romance with Len began to decline, but did not stop. It seemed that what she had with Len had nothing to do with her marriage to Bill. She realized that she loved Bill in a way that Lena could never love, and for obvious reasons. Bill was a good man and a loving husband. Len was rich and powerful, but completely useless as a person. Len got her a job with the best criminal defense firm in the state. There she succeeded, and two years later, Annabelle appeared. She was Bill's daughter in every way, except perhaps one. Kate refused to take a paternity test. She didn't want to know, and it would have been disloyal to Bill. He will always be the father of her children, no matter what. Len saw things differently. He had never seen anything other than a photograph of Annabelle, but he insisted that she was his child. He was intensifying the relationship and wanted Bill to know about it. But Kate refused this demand. Bill, the wonderful man she married, must never know about this. He was the man who took care of their child, the best father Annabelle could have had. The thought that Agent Marks could accuse Bill so casually was very upsetting. Kate almost certainly knew that if her lover was killed, suspicion would fall on her husband. But no one who knew Bill could believe that he would do such a thing. Kate was now obligated to Bill. At all costs, she must protect him from the ugly truth. Why should her sins hurt an innocent? Kate picked up the phone and made a call that she hoped would help keep her secret. Special Agent Tom Makepeace had spent four nights the previous week in Lieutenant Connie Baker's bed. Several times they actually discussed the case they were working on together. But mostly they had sex. That was great. Tom realized that after the divorce, he lived like in a dream. He needed a new woman. Connie was exactly the woman he needed. Uninhibited and not making any demands. He knew she hoped their romance would go somewhere, but damn, so did he. I'm just a little cautious, he thought. Once bitten, twice shy. Tom Makepeace's first marriage broke up when his wife left him for a younger man after 18 years of marriage. One day he came home to find her sitting at the kitchen table with a glass of red wine and a serious expression on her face. After she said, we need to talk, followed by a frank explanation that she was unhappy, and then she handed him a set of divorce papers. Eighteen years later, she demanded all of their assets, half of his pension and most of his salary, as alimony. They had a boy and a girl who were still in high school. He usually had very good control over himself, but here he lost control. They had a difficult divorce. Much to his ex-wife's surprise, their children choose their father over the new guy. Now Tom received alimony, and her share of the assets ended up being less than 30%. Tom was lucky when his case was assigned to a very sympathetic female judge. When he arrived at the office on Tuesday, he thought about Connie. But he needed to deal with Agent Marks. As an exception, Sheila did as she was told. Reviewing Bill Ford's alibi, she was clearly reserved. Tom was warned to finish everything quickly and to remain silent in front of the judge about the rough edges. Those at the top will be happy to have a death as a result of robbery, Obviously, someone pulled some strings. Nobody wanted a scandal except Sheila. My gut tells me that the guy did it, sir, 
she said. Not sir. Tom, Mac, or Agent Makepeace, but not sir. You're no longer in the army, Agent Marks, he said a little harsher than he intended. Sorry, see, Mac. It just fits so well. A former military policeman, he rose from private to captain. He had a good rating on the range. He is certainly capable and has the best motive. And it won't hurt if the subsequent scandal ruins Catherine Ford Morgan, Tom realized. Sheila took an immediate dislike to this woman, Morgan. Tom couldn't help but approve of this. Make peace should have criticized Kate Morgan, but he long ago learned to separate personal feelings from work. Moreover, he understood the situation in which she found herself. A powerful man came into her life. Sure, she made some bad decisions, but let those who are without sin themselves criticize her. He also understood a woman like Sheila, not very feminine, who, as the office jesters whispered behind her back, was a transsexual. She blamed others for her troubles. It didn't help that she was physically more than half the out-of-shape male agents in the office. She also put all female agents to shame with her physical abilities and dedication to duty. Tom caught her muffled conversations several times on her personal cell phone. Apparently there was a love interest, and he thought she probably left the army to follow him or her. The office staff generally believed it was her, but Marx kept this information to herself. Look, I don't want to be harsh here, but we need more than just a good motive and your instincts. So, figure out a way to nail Mr. Ford or whitewash him, Tom said. Three days later, Sheila beamed as she dropped a large filing box onto her desk. What is it? asked Tom. Safety tapes from the railway station. They re-record every seven days, she said. Sorry, but I don't understand, said Tom. Because they use this outdated system, the images are not erased. They remain under the new records. Specialists in the laboratory say they can restore the night we want. Tom smiled and looked into the box. Good job, agent, but how many tapes do you have there? Twenty-seven with twelve hours of continuously compressed recording on each tape, Sheila said. Well, good luck to you and the laboratory assistants. And I have a hot date, he said, laughing. In fact, he was dating Connie again. This was getting serious, and he was half elated and half scared. He arrived at Connie's with the local newspaper and the intention of choosing a movie to watch together. Connie met him at the door, dressed in high heels, stockings, and nothing else. I thought we were going to watch a movie, he stammered. Sorry, baby, I need my man, and I need him right now, she said, dragging him into the bedroom. Mac found a tired Sheila Marks in the office. You sure don't look like you had a good weekend, he said. Yeah, try looking at the 27 CCTV tape sometime, and then I'll see what you look like, she replied. Mac laughed. I don't sympathize. You brought this on yourself. Sheila just grumbled something in response. Well, he asked. Well, it's on tape. Considering the bunch of slackers he's watching, if he weren't there, nothing would get done. If these railway guards had walked any slower, they would have moved backwards. Mac suppressed a smile. So I guess my husband didn't do it. Sheila chuckled in response. Maybe he paid someone? Which undermines the idea that the judge knew the attacker. That is why we suspected the husband in the first place. So this is just a bad robbery? I find it hard to believe, she said. Mac didn't answer. They only had one lead from the jewelry sale. It didn't seem right, but you go where the evidence leads. Agent Marks jumped out of the car in front of the El Dorado Hotel, a rented room in the poor part of town. Agent Make Piss was slower. After all, there was no rush. Connie waited at the hotel elevator while Sheila raced up the stairs. Seriously, Mac, what motivates your partner? Connie asked. Oh, I guess the usual, he said, shrugging. Sheila had seemed almost depressed ever since she'd been looking at the footage from the train station as if packing them for return to the railroad was a personal failure on her part. Do you think she's a lesbian? Maybe, but if so, she doesn't play where she works. But honestly, I have no idea. I never saw her glance at either men or women. A little unnatural, don't you think? Anything can happen. 
but she can't stand women like Mrs. Ford, he said. Well, don't discount you, Lucy. When you're a woman like Shayla Marks, it's hard to sympathize with a beauty like Kate Ford. Watching women like Mrs. Ford juggle men is hard for any woman, Connie said. And yet, it seems to me that one lonely woman I know has a soft spot for this slut. I have good reasons. Firstly, I'm older. And secondly, I'm a professional and know how easy it is to get into a bad situation in the workplace. Oh, sounds like talking about experience. I bet most women, regardless of their appearance, have been subjected to unwanted attention from a man in a higher position. In Morgan's case, she was targeted by a very powerful man at a very vulnerable time in her professional life. She probably just didn't see a way out. As they climbed the stairs, they continued to talk, thereby avoiding the unpleasant smell and danger of the elevator. I'm sorry, Sheila. Looks like she's a loner, Connie said. Well, she doesn't have many friends. I've heard of a few army buddies. She supposedly listens to music with someone, but doesn't talk about anyone. She's closed off, Max said. The room they eventually entered smelled of death. The interrogator was stacking the corpse. Sheila watched the body being carried away, her face as blank as ever. The forensic team was doing their job, but the reason Connie called was on a small table that was apparently used for the dual purpose of eating and preparing drugs. Two bags of evidence, one of which contained a Walter P-38 automatic pistol and the other a gold Rolex watch. Mac picked up the package with the watch. He could easily make out the writing inside. Love, Catherine and Annabelle, your ladies. Any ideas about the cause of death? Mac asked Connie. Yes, it looks like a natural death. He's an Afghanistan veteran, Private Salvatore Marsh, back with a pretty serious drug problem. Somewhere I contracted HIV. He has been receiving treatment for the past few months and has been released from the hospital. It was assumed that he was now in a hospice, but in fact he was discharged from there. I assume he was self-medicating. We think it was either the disease or the drugs that got him, Connie said. Are you going to investigate this? Asked Mac. I don't see the point. It matches the evidence. I don't know why he decided to rob the judge, but he had a gun and stolen items. And since he's dead, if anyone else was involved, we'll never know. So the bitch is going free, Sheila said. None of them saw her follow them. Cover it, Max said, turning to Sheila Marks. I think there's been enough pain here, Connie said. It's time to move on. Sheila just shrugged. Mac felt that she felt somehow sadder today. What the woman carried inside her was more urgent than usual. Mario's was relatively crowded on a Tuesday night, but it was ladies' night. Ben Walker started playing love songs. Slow music brought most of the visitors to the dance floor. The tall woman with short, dark hair in the far corner of the bar was an exception. If you got close enough, you could see tears in the corners of her eyes. I hope they're not because of me, Sheila, I said, sitting down next to her at the bar. She turned away and answered, no, I didn't insist, but waited for her like a good friend. I'm not crying. I'm just thinking about Sal. I figured he was clean, she said. He did, but not fast enough, I said. Well, I think you're safe now, she said. Did the tapes work? Like a spell. Nobody even looked at them. I think some people can beat the system. Oh, in the end, the system will win anyway, but not this time. The bartender brought the drinks I ordered and I handed it to Sheila. Come on, I said. Drink to Salvatore March, who maimed three officers and killed one judge. Not bad for a man whose hands were shaking too much to hold a gun. She smiled weakly, but clinked glasses with me and took a sip of her vodka martini. To a good comrade, she said, and then, as if it were an afterthought, you won't hurt her. I didn't need to ask who she meant. She is Annabelle's mother, plus she makes a ton of money. I think I have some right to them. The latter brought her first real smile. You know, when you're not around, I miss you, she said, turning to me and brushing away her tears. I would even love you if everything were different. What do you mean when you say you don't? I asked, pulling her towards me. You know what I mean, she said, laughing quietly in shame. Seriously, though, as I have said many times, love is not a physical act. 
This is all we do for each other, I said, clinking her glass and drinking my first martini of the evening. We drank, and then I took her home and put her to bed, a bed she had not shared with any man since the gang rape. In some ways, she was the strongest woman I knew. She was capable of driving a full clip of an M4 carbine into the legs of the men who hurt her. She put all three of them in wheelchairs for life. So they'll never do it again, she said. But when you get to know her well, you realize that inside, she was a hurt little girl. She was my little girl, my friend and my comrade. We would always be together. There was no sex. But in the end, that's why I had my own slut. I ordered two fresh drinks, and when they arrived, I raised my glass and said, For us, I said, the army is strong. The army is strong, she answered. Do you want to dance? I asked. When she nodded, I took my lady to the dance floor. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.